Well, hello. I'm uh, Martin Green from UNSW Sydney, and today I'd like to talk to you on the topic of no matter how small, just how those solar cells that I'm holding in the photo below, really very small, how they're having an enormous impact in the fight against climate change. Incidentally, those cells were our last entry in a long-standing record. So we held the record for silicon solar cell performance at UNSW for 30 of the last 38 years. And this was the last chapter in that um, sustained record period. So to understand how a solar cell works, we have to go back to Albert Einstein. And he was the one that realised that you had to regard light in some contexts as, as if it was a little particle. And so you can regard the sun after Einstein um, as shooting little projectiles at you, these photons. And the photons have different colours. So uh, the violet ones are the really energetic ones and they give you sunburn and everything. And the red ones are the less energetic ones. Um, but that was you know, impossible to understand solar cells without the photon concept. And uh, Einstein's work, you know, also led to the development of quantum mechanics, you know, a fairly indirect route, but uh, it was triggered by uh, his work on quantization of, uh, of light. Uh, and quantum mechanics is essential to understand the other part of the solar cell, which is the semiconductor silicon that's used in the solar cell itself. So this just shows, shows the basic operation, the sunlight or the photons uh, shot into the cell. And um, what they do there is they uh, excite electrons within the uh, silicon material up to excited states. And uh, the solar cell is designed so that all these electrons move off in the same direction. So if you connect uh, electrical load between the front and the back contacts to the solar cell, you'll get an electrical current flowing through it. So the, the solar cell is just really a, a photon converter. It converts a photon ideally to one electron that flows through that electrical load. And um, you know, the operation is very simple. You know, just photons in, electrons out. Uh, but the underlying physics took uh, people like Albert Einstein to uh, develop the understanding that allows us to design these things. So uh, simple to use, but uh, quite sophisticated in the underlying technology. Uh, the solar cells I was holding were quite small. The commercial ones are a little bit bigger. So for a long time, they were 156 millimetre square, six inches in the old units. Um, but more recently, gone to bigger uh, wafer sizes, up to 10 millimetre square or eight inch square. And uh, to, on the right there is just uh, someone holding a couple of eight inch and six inch wafers, just giving a, a better idea of the size. Uh, but still quite small, very much human-scaled technology. The cells aren't used bare like that. They're packaged into what's called a solar module. And this just shows uh, some typical modules. You have a glass cover sheet and everything's nicely packaged in that with uh, electrical leads coming out to provide the electrical connection. Um, but the modules have been getting bigger too. So um, that gentleman there is six foot tall. So uh, some of them are getting quite large, if, you know, up to three square metres in uh, area. Um, the beauty of the solar cells, it can be used in systems that are either very small or very large. So on the left there is a very small application in a solar powered watch. So, uh, and on the right is a very large one, a large powered station in Egypt near the Aswan Dam. Looks more interesting from the ground, as you can see in the inserted photo there. Uh, but that system is one of the world's biggest solar at the moment. It's 1.7 gigawatts. So that's um, the size of a fairly average uh, coal-fired or nuclear power plant. So, um, you know, most of about half the Australian coal plant are half smaller than that. The other half are bigger. Um, but um, this year, uh, there'll be about 100 times that amount of solar installed worldwide. So that just represents the size there, a small fraction of the total manufacturing capacity um, that's being made at the moment. Um, so uh, that 190 gigawatts that's being made this year uh, is about 33% more than last year. So the industry grew 33% in that year. If it keeps growing at about 25% year, somewhat a little bit slower, over the next decade, 
We'll get to 1,000 gigawatts a year, or another way of saying that is one terawatt of photovoltaics a year manufacturing. And that's really very important, as I'll explain a little bit later on. The really big thing that's happened with solar over the last 10 years or so is a huge reduction in price. Um, and this graph here just shows that, 24 times reduction in 12 years. This just shows the wholesale price in large quantities and so on. But um, uh, the large modules there um, beside the gentleman are really 2.4 metres tall or about eight feet. Um, and uh, they are about 700 watts rating. So uh, in 2008, they would have cost $2,800 each at the wholesale level. Um, but now they're just over 100. So, um, you know, that just gives you an idea of the enormity of the difference. So something that was really very expensive now becomes very affordable. And that's really opened up enormous new opportunities for solar in large-scale applications. Uh, Australians played a big role in these cost reductions in two different ways. Um, and uh, the gentleman, uh, Saren Circle there, uh, Zheng Rong Shi, he was one of my PhD students, uh, he's largely to blame for these cost reductions in that um, he was born in China but an Australian citizen now, but he was fired with the ambition of establishing solar manufacturing in China back at the turn of the century when absolutely nothing was happening in that area in China. And he was very successful. This is the opening of his first factory and I got to help him cut the ribbon, uh, fairly heavy lifting. And um, that factory was a huge success. Um, and he was doing quite well just selling the product. But then he had an even better idea. He decided to list on the New York Stock Exchange, as shown in the photo on the right there uh, on at the top. So he was the first private Chinese company to list on the New York Stock Exchange, and it was a huge success. It was the biggest technology float of 2005, the year that he listed. And um, that was great for Zhengrong, but the other thing it did was triggered interest in a host of other uh, people in uh, following Zheng Rong's footsteps, uh, particularly um, other students within my group. And so many of these founded other companies in China to do the same thing that Zheng Rong had done. And, um, you know, there was plenty of uh, interest from uh, US investment banks and so on in getting them onto the exchanges, seeing Zheng Rong had done well with his company. So there was a flood of companies between 2005 and the global financial crisis listing on the different exchanges. And they were companies that were either founded by my students or um, had my students in senior positions. So many were formed as Chinese-Australian joint, joint ventures with my students involved. So the competition between these companies that were well cashed up from US investment um, in a limited market sort of the only way out is to reduce your costs to try and maintain market share. So that caused very dramatic reduction in costs from 2008 to 2012. That's shown by the arrow there. Um, so that was an Australian-led charge. And the, the second phase, more recent phase, also Australian-led, the actual underpinning of it happened a little bit earlier. And this is a photo in 1985 of my team. And many of the people in that photo actually went on to partake in that... Um, uh, Chinese adventure at the turn of the century. Um, but uh, we were working on high efficiency cells. And as I said, we held the world record for 30 of the last 38 years. And this was a team that developed what's called the PERC cell. So any manufacturer now will sell you a PERC cell because 90% of the world production is now PERC. But PERC caused this second um, cost reduction after 2016 because of its higher performance and other very favourable features. So a second Australian initiative that um, has resulted in low cost. So climate change has been described as the biggest challenge that humanity has ever faced. And um, these tiny solar cells uh, are positioned to play a great role in that. And this just sort of explains how, um, so this is a, a graph that I first saw in 2015, but it's just showing CO2 emissions in gigatons per year up to 2014 and then one of these projections that shows you what you need to do to maintain global temperature rise to something manageable hopefully of uh, two degrees or or less um, and uh, when I saw this it looked pretty hopeless because um, if you look at the bottom those colored regions just show 
what's expected in the way of emissions from the four biggest emitters, you know, even taking into account their best efforts to control things. So you can see that by the end of the decade, we'd be running into a, a problem in that the whole budget would be using by these four, notwithstanding the 200 plus other countries in the world whose emissions you had to take into account. Um, so, but with the you know recent uh, progress in photovoltaics and the strong uptake and so on, the situation has changed a little bit. Um, and those three arrows up at the right, the red ones just sort of show the effect of um, one terawatt a year installation of photovoltaics if it's displacing coal from electricity uh, production or oil from transport which are two of the biggest emitters so you can see that year after year if you install one terawatt it puts you on the right trajectory to follow that two degree trajectory you know providing every everything else can be kept under control so that's the way these tiny cells are positioned to play a big role in climate change mitigation so, um, you know, I was the only one talking about this at one stage, but it's really great to see that even the more conservative parts of the energy industry are now getting on board. So the International Energy Agency has long been very sceptical of the role that uh, solar and other renewables can play in the future. But they've changed their tune recently, thank goodness. And uh, this is their most recent uh, roadmap, which is very heavily solar-based. So they point out that solar now provides the cheapest electricity in history with that 24 times cost, cost I mentioned before, cost reduction. And they're projecting as part of their roadmap, their strategy is to um, make the 2020s a, de a decade of massive installation of clean energy, particularly solar. So growing solar capacity to five terawatts by, the, uh, by 2030, which is you know, roughly in line with that one terawatt a year by the end of that decade I previously mentioned. So I guess the moral of the talk, no matter how small, these smaller solar cells have contributed to providing a very potent weapon in addressing climate change in two separate ways. So, you know, by training the people who then had the confidence to set up industries in what for many of us is a foreign land, um, you know, that was one thing. And then the actual technology developed as part of that activity itself has led to its own uh, contribution to cost reduction. So thank you very much for your attention.